Chapter 3 Painting in Italy from the Beginning of the Renaissance to the Present Century Part 2 But Giovanni Bellini was the greatest of his family and must stand as the founder of true Venetian painting. His works may be divided into two periods, those that were done before and those after he learned the use of oil colors. His masterpieces, which can still be seen in the academy and the churches of Venice, were painted after he was 65 years old. The works of Giovanni Bellini are numerous in Venice and are also seen in the principal galleries of Europe. He did not paint a great variety of subjects, neither was his imagination very poetical, but there was a moral beauty in his figures. He seems to have made humanity as elevated as it can be, and to have stopped just on the line which separates earthly excellence from the heavenly, he often painted the single figure of Christ of which Luke says, By grand nobleness of expression, solemn bearing, and an excellent arrangement of the drapery, he reached a dignity which has rarely been surpassed. Near the close of his life, he painted a few subjects which represent gay and festive scenes and are more youthful in spirit than those works of his earlier years. The two brothers were buried side by side in the church of S.S. Giovanni e Paolo in Venice. There were also good painters in Padua, Ferrara, and Verona in the 15th century because he felt himself so inferior the great painter of Urbino. Raphael sent his Saint Cecilia to Francia and asked him to care for it and see it hung in its place. He did so, but did not live long after this. It is well known that these two masters were good friends and correspondent, but it is not certain that they may ever met. Francia's pictures are numerous. His portraits are excellent. Many of his works are still in Bologna. Andrea Mantegna of Padua was a very important artist. He spent the best part of his life in the service of the Duke of Mantua. But his influence was felt in all Italy for his marriage with the daughter of Jacopo Bellini brought him into relations with many artists. His services were sought by various sovereigns whose offers he refused until Pope Innocent VIII summoned him to Rome to paint a chapel in the Vatican. After two years there, he returned to Mantua, where he died. His pictures are in all large collections. His finest works are Madonnas at the Louvre, Paris, and in the Church of St. Zeno at Verona. Montegno was a fine engraver also, and his plates are now very valuable. In the Umbrian school, Pietro Perugino was a notable painter. He was important on account of his own work and because he was the master of the great Raphael. His pictures were simple and devout in their spirit and brilliant in color. In fact, he is considered as a founder of the style which Raphael perfected. His works are in the principal galleries of Europe and he had many followers of whom we have not space to speak. Francisco Francia was a founder of the school of Bologna. 
His true name was Francisco de Marco Raibolini, and he was a goldsmith of repute before he was a painter. He was also master of the mint to the Bentivoglio and to Pope Julius II at Bologna. It is not possible to say when he began to paint, but his earliest known work is dated 1490 or 1494 and is in the gallery of Bologna. His pictures resemble those of Perugino and Raphael, and it is said that he died of sorrow because he felt himself so inferior to the great painter of Urbino. Raphael sent his Saint Cecilia to Francia and asked him to care for it and see it hung in its place. He did so, but did not live long after this. It is well known that these two masters were good friends and corresponded, but it is not certain that they ever met. Francia's pictures are numerous. His portraits are excellent. Many of his works are still in Bologna. We come now to one of the most celebrated masters of Italy, Leonardo da Vinci, the head of the Lombard of Milanese school. He was not the equal of the great masters, Michelangelo, Raphael, and Titian, but he stands between them and the painters who preceded him or of those of his own day. In some respects, however, he was the most extraordinary man of his time. His talents were many-sided, for he was not only a great artist, but also a fine scholar. In mathematics and mechanics, he wrote poetry and composed music. And was with all this so attractive personally and so brilliant in his manner that he was a favorite wherever he went. It is probable that his versatility prevented his being very great in any one thing, while he was remarkable in many things. When still very young, Leonardo showed his artistic talent. The paper upon which he worked out his sums was frequently bordered with little pictures which he drew while thinking on his lessons. And these sketches at last attracted his father's attention. And he slowed them to his friend Andrea Verrocchio, an artist of Florence, who advised that the boy should become a painter. Accordingly, in 1470, when 18 years old, Leonardo was placed under the care of Veronocchio, who was like a kind father to his pupils. He was not only a painter, but also an architect and a sculptor, a musician, and a geometer. And he especially excelled in making exquisite cups of gold and silver, crucifixes and statuettes, such as were in the great demand for the use of the priesthood in those days. Pietro Perugino was a fellow pupil with Leonardo, and they too soon surpassed their master in painting. And at last, when Verrocchio was painting a picture for the monks of Vallambrosa and desired Leonardo to execute an angel in it, the work of his pupil was so much better than his own that the old painter desired to throw his brush aside forever. The picture is now in the Academy of Florence and represents the baptism of Christ. With all its refinement and sweetness, Leonardo had a liking for the audible. It once happened that a countryman brought to his father a circular piece of wood cut from a fig tree and desired to have it painted for a shield. It was handed over to Leonardo, 
who collected in his room a number of lizards, snakes, bats, hedgehogs, and other frightful creatures. And from this painted an unknown monster having certain characteristics of the horrid things he had about him. The hideous creature was surrounded by fire and was breathing out flames. When his father saw it, he ran away in a fright, and Leonardo was greatly pleased at this. The countryman received an ordinary shield, and this Rotelio del Fico, or Shield of Fig Tree Wood, was sold to a merchant for 100 ducats, and again to the Duke of Milan for three times that sum. This shield has now been lost for more than three centuries. But another horror, the Medusa's head, is in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, and is a head surrounded by interlacing serpents, the eyes being glassy and death-like, and the mouth most revolting in expression. While in Florence, Leonardo accomplished much but was at times diverted from his painting by his love of science, sometimes making studies in astronomy and again in natural history and botany. He also went much into society and lived extravagantly. He had the power to remember faces that he had been accidentally and could make fine portraits from memory. He was also accustomed to invite to his house people from the lower classes. He would assume them while he sketched their faces, making good portraits at times, and again, ridiculous caricatures. He even went so far, for the sake of his art, as to accompany criminals to the place of execution, in order to study their expressions. After a time, Leonardo wished to secure some fixed income and wrote to the Duke of Milan, Ludovico Sforza, called Moro II, offering his services to the prince. This resulted in his going to Milan, where he received a generous salary, and became very popular with the Duke and all the court both as a painter and as a gentleman. The Duke governed as the regent for his young nephew and gathered about him talented men for the benefit of the young prince. He also led a gay life and his court was the scene of constant festivities. Leonardo's varied talents were very useful to the Duke. He could assist him in everything by advice and counsel, by plans for adorning his city, by music and poetry, in his leisure hours, and by painting the portraits of his favorites. Some of these last are now famous pictures, that of Luceria Crevelli, is believed to be in the Louvre at Paris, where it is called La Belle Fernorier. The Duke conferred a great honor on Leonardo by choosing him to be the founder and director of an academy which he had long wished to establish. It was called the Academia Leonardo Vinci and had for its purpose to bring together of distinguished artists and men of letters. Leonardo was appointed superintendent of all the feats and entertainments given by the court, and in this department he did some marvelous things. He also superintended great work in engineering which has brought to perfection, to the wonder of old Italy. It was no less an undertaking than bringing the waters of the Ada from Mortisana to Milan. A distance of nearly 200 miles. In spite of all these occupations, the artist found time to study anatomy. 
and to write some valuable works. At length, Moro II became the established duke, and at his brilliant court, Leonardo led a most agreeable life. But he was so occupied with many things that he painted comparatively few pictures. At length, the duke desired him to paint a picture of the Last Supper on the wall of the refectory in the convent of the Madonna del Grazi. This was his greatest work in Milan, and a wonderful masterpiece. It was commenced about 1496, and was finished in a very short time. We must now judge of it from copies and engravings, for it has been so injured as to give no satisfaction to one who sees it. Some good copies were made before it was thus ruined, and numerous engravings make it familiar to all the world. A copy in the Royal Academy, London, was made by one of the Leonardo's pupils, and is the size of the original. It is said that the prior of the convent complained to the duke of the length of time the artist was spending upon this picture. When the duke questioned the painter, he said that he was greatly troubled to find a face which pleased him for that of Judas Iscariot. He added that he was willing to allow the prior to sit for this figure and thus hasten the work. This answer pleased the duke and silenced the prior. After a time, misfortunes overtook the duke, and Leonardo was reduced to poverty. Finally, Moro II was imprisoned, and in 1500s, Leonardo returned to Florence, where he was honorably received. He was not happy here. However, for he was not the one important artist. He had been absent 19 years and great changes had taken place. Michelangelo and Raphael were just becoming famous and they with other artists welcomed Leonardo for his fame had reached them from Milan. However, he painted some fine pictures at this time. Among them, were the adoration of the kings, now in the Uffizi Gallery, and a portrait of Ginevra Benci, also in the same gallery. This lady must have been very beautiful. Gerlandajo introduced her portrait into two of his frescoes. But the most remarkable portrait was that known as Mona Lisa del Giocondo, which is in the Louvre and is called by some critics, the finest work of this master. The lady was the wife of Francesco del Giocondo, a lovely woman and some supposed that she was very dear to Leonardo. He worked upon it for four years and still thought it unfinished. The face has a deep thoughtful expression. The eyelids are a little weary perhaps, and through it all, there is a suggestion of something not quite understood. A mystery. The hands are graceful, of perfect form, and the rocky background gives an unusual fascination to the whole picture. Leonardo must have loved the picture himself, and it is not strange that he lavished more time upon it than he gave to the great picture of the Last Supper. Leonardo sold this picture to Francis I for $9,000, which was then an enormous sum, though now one could scarcely fix a price upon it. In 1860, the Emperor of Russia paid $12,000 for a Saint Sebastian by Leonardo, and in 1865, a Madonna by him was sold in Paris for about $16,000.
Of course, his pictures are rarely sold, but when they are, great sums are given for them. In 1502, Caesar Borgia appointed Leonardo his engineer and sent him to travel through central Italy to inspect his fortresses. But this usurper soon fled to Spain, and in 1503, our painter was again in Florence. In 1504, his father died. From 1507 to 1512, Leonardo was the summit of his greatness. Louis XII appointed him his partner, and he labored for this monarch also to improve the waterworks of Milan. For seven years, he dwelt at Milan, making frequent journeys to Florence. But the political troubles of the time made Lombardy an uncongenial home for any artist, and Leonardo with a few pupils went to Florence, and then on to Rome. Pope Leo X received him cordially enough and told him to work for the glory of God. Italy Leo X and Leonardo da Vinci. But Leonardo was not happy in Rome, where Michelangelo and Raphael were in great favor. And when Francis I made his successes in Italy in 1515, Leonardo hastened to Lombardy to meet him. The new king of France restored him to the office to which Louis XII had appointed him and gave him an annual pension of 700 gold crowns.